Support for Conversations with Elle McFarland was provided by Old National Bank Comcast Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance and North American Banking Company I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Uh, Trent Bowman is a Vice President and Community Development Officer for Klein Bank, which is a division of Old National Bank. Uh, first of all, we thank Old National for sponsoring uh, today's program. And Trent, thank you for being part of making that happen. You know, Trent's uh, role as Vice President and Community Development Officer for Klein uh, reflects his interests, his intent, his assignment to meet the home lending needs of residents in the Minneapolis area. Trent is passionate about his commitment to guide minority individuals and families down the path of home ownership. He works tirelessly with prospective homeowners to identify programs that make purchasing a home possible. In fact, he frequently teaches classes for first-time home buyers, and in addition, he serves as a board member for the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. It's called NARAB. He also is heavily involved uh, with a number of major organizations that are focused on increasing minority home ownership. These include the Local Initiatives Support Corporation Advisory Council, uh, the Home Ownership Alliance of Minnesota, the Minneapolis Urban League, Model Cities, Neighborhood Partners, and Neighborhood Economic Opportunity Network, it's called NEON. Trent himself is a native of North Minneapolis uh, mm -hmm. and a proud graduate of North High, <laughs> go Polars, right? Uh -huh. uh, and a, a graduate of Minneapolis Community College. Trent, thank you for being here. Good to see you again. Thank you for having me. And, and thanks for the support of Old National, uh, supporting the work of NARAB and of Home Ownership Alliance to advance this cause of creating wealth in our community. Uh, and so you've been a advocate, an advocate of getting the right information to people at the right time exactly. so they can get on the path of becoming homeowners. And you always caution people, don't run headlong into something that you're not prepared for. Right. Preparation is everything. Talk about your philosophy, how you try to help people be realistic mm -hmm. and therefore successful as they move towards uh, wealth creation through home ownership. Thank you, Al. My philosophy and one of the things that I'm very passionate about and one of the things that I push is this is something that you just don't do over the phone. Um, you, you have two sets of numbers that are affiliated with you uh, that are very important and that's your date of birth and that's your social security number. Mm -hmm. So why would you give that information to a voice? I'm a firm believer, especially for first time home buyers, especially for people uh, of color in the community, is that you need to have options. Mm -hmm. You need to go through the process and that process starts with a consultation. Meet with your loan officer. Do that one-on-one -on -one consultation. Understand the products and programs that are available for you. Mm -hmm. Push. We try to push credit scores on a higher brand instead of that old-school mentality. Qualify for anything. You know, you can get in with a 580 credit score, or you can get in with a 590 or a 600. I'm not saying you can't buy with those credit scores, but I'm saying is. Why not qualify for the smorgasbord of products? Mm -hmm. We all go to buffets, it's all you can eat. Why not have all the products you can qualify for? And how do you get that? By having better credit scores. My passion now is push the higher credit scores. Mm -hmm. Let's get people in with the 680s, the 700s, and then let's map don't, out. Don't be afraid of having good credit. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> don't be afraid. Right, yeah, right. right. Good credit is a blessing. That's right. It's not, you know, it's not a penalty. So everything in life now is being generated based on credit scores, mm -hmm. getting a job, your insurance, all of these things are being based on or your premium or what your percentage is going to be is going to be based on credit. Mm -hmm. So why can't we as a community come, in, come to the game, come to the table with the better credit scores? So when you come to see me, I'm going to lay out all the products that are available for you, whether it be our in-house product, which is uh, our ho the home manager program, whether it's FHA, 
whether it's Minnesota Housing, the, the startup program, whether it's Home Ready, which is a conventional 3% program, I'm going to lay out the, the difference between the principal and interest payment and then lifestyle. Mm -hmm. What is your lifestyle? Let's mm -hmm. ask the people the questions. Mm -hmm. What do you enjoy doing? Do you have kids? Do, are they in extracurricular activities? Buying a house should be something to enjoy, not something where you're, uh, you're pressing or you start making excuses for yourself. Well, I gotta get a second job or I can have my brother live with me. And we know these things aren't gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So let's get the people the dream home they can afford. Mm -hmm. When I started this business many, many years ago and I used to sit and do these consultations and uh, clients would say, well, I want my dream home. And I used to think, dream home, dream home. What is that dream home? So, well, so client is 21 and what? Yeah, right, right. And, so, and, and what? Yeah. What's he, what's he, or, she, he or she saying to you? Right. That, uh, my dream home is a three-bedroom house, full basement, two-car garage, uh, big, big yard, fence. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, dream home, but what can you afford? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's break those payments down for you. How does that look like? And you can kind of tell... If, it's, if you're in the ballpark based on the people's body language. Mm -hmm. So example, I'll ask a, a person the question, what are you paying in rent? Well, I'll say, well, I'm paying $900. Okay, where do you see your mortgage payment at? Well, I wanna be about 1100, okay? So what does that look like on a purchase price perspective? Mm -hmm. 250,000, okay. Well, let's look at the numbers based on 250,000 and does that equate to an $1,100 payment? Mm -hmm. So once you run the numbers, you, you kind of see where it's at. Now you got about a fifteen, sixteen hundred dollar payment. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the body and you see the language. You kind of see the, the squibbling and mm -hmm. the uh, mm -hmm. sixteen hundred versus eleven hundred versus what you're paying now at nine hundred. Yep, double. Yep. Now, how does life look? And plus, things got to go with it. Exactly, mm -hmm. because once you sign on that dotted line, you you're going to create new debt. I call it house debt. What is house debt? House debt is all those things you don't think about. Furnace water softener, yard work, shoveling, miscellaneous things. Things come up mm -hmm. that you don't even know. You, you know, we just had a crazy uh, February for snow. Mm -hmm. You got ice banks that are hanging off the side of your house. Who's gonna, you gotta pay for that. You gotta pay for a contractor to come and clear those ice banks out. So the bottom line is we want people to buy the dream home you can afford. Mm -hmm. Buy the house of substance. Get real. Yeah, be real. Yeah, yeah. I, we're, I'm not going to sugarcoat anything, mm -hmm. and then I'm going to break the payments down. I'm going to break the numbers down, mm -hmm. and then once we have a good filling, and we we have now we have a, a positive number and uh, what this individual can qualify for, that's where our real estate partners really come into play because they're the key. Because if if the loan officers explain to the real estate agent mm -hmm. this individual qualifies for a hundred and fifty thousand dollar property. It's important for our real estate partners to start showing our clients properties not right at 150, but maybe work your way up to 150. Mm -hmm. Start at 125, mm -hmm. 130. I understand that the, there's mm -hmm. nothing out there, but you never know. You might find a diamond in the rough at 140. You might find a gold mine at 135. Mm -hmm. I've done this for a long time, and it, it has happened. So consultation is very important. At one-on-one, -on -one, get to know who you're working with. This is one of the biggest investments you're gonna make in life. This is something you can pass down to your kids and change the narrative. And, it, and it, that narrative really, Al, changes with credit. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I just, again, I hear it all the time. And I, again, I'm not telling anybody, if you need to buy and your credit scores are where they're at, God bless you. Mm -hmm. But I'm all I'm, what I'm saying is, <coughs> let's change that narrative. Let's come to the tables with the 680s and the 700s and the 740s. Let's qualify for all the products and let us make, the, make us where we can make the decision because we have options. Don't pigeonhole yourself into one product. I teach first time home buyer classes and I can honestly tell you, after a class, there's always one person, maybe two, sometimes three, that will come to me and say, Trent, I didn't know I had options. All I was told was FHA. Mm -hmm. Well, what's your credit score? Well, I have a 740 credit score. So they didn't talk to you about some of the other options in the down payment assistance programs that are available? No. So these are, now I'm giving you power now. Mm -hmm. So go back to your own officer and ask the questions. That's a real challenge in our community. One of the stories that I had heard years ago, Trent, uh, talked about 
you know, the conditioning that mm -hmm. we have in our community that sometimes does not serve us well. Mm -hmm. And it's not based on what we've done, it's based on historical mm -hmm. inequities mm -hmm. and disparities and in some ways discrimination in the industry mm -hmm. that reflected the culture mm -hmm. uh, of discrimination. For example, I would hear that uh, as a result, when African American people uh, looking for a home would go and ask a uh, lender for, you know, uh, a mortgage. Mm -hmm. uh, if the offer was accepted, they would be so relieved mm -hmm. because they were so stressed mm -hmm. that they would say thank you and take it. Or if they got a no, they would internalize that so deeply and give up and walk away. Both answers are wrong. You can mm -hmm. do whatever you want to, mm -hmm. but by comparison, our European brothers and, and neighbors and friends will say, yeah, I, I like that offer, but let me go to five more banks. Right. Since I know I got one, mm -hmm. let me go and ask three more or two more or five mm -hmm. more and negotiate the very best rate. So part of our training mm -hmm. has not been training us, training to have us be that intentional mm -hmm. in shopping for the best rate. Mm -hmm. And that equates to sort of not being prepared right. in general. And how do we address that? Mm -hmm. Well, you're addressing that right. through the conference coming up next week. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, NARAB is putting on a project in North Minneapolis at the uh, John B. Davis mm -hmm. Education Center on West Broadway talking about home ownership. Talk about that project. Right, thank you. Yeah, it's the, the, it's the NARAB Housing Fair. Um, Old National Banks, one of the major sponsors. <laughs> but what it is, it, it, and to just to kind of go off of what Al is asking on when it comes down to the interest rates and people shopping, shopping around, um, and then you know people getting that fast no, mm -hmm. you know, and 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 I'll, I'll share a story uh, back when I was a young man and when my mother, God rest her soul, uh, was trying to purchase her first home, mm -hmm. and we went into a particular bank and she was told no right away mm -hmm. you know and at that time I didn't have any clue or any idea mm -hmm. that I would be doing this business but it but for some reason it resonated with me it stuck with me because he the, the, this particular individual really never gave her an option mm -hmm. he never really filtered any other choices it was just a fast no so as I started to grow into this business and I started to learn more about this business, and again, you know, back in the good old days, it was all about the rate, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what's your rate, you know, 4%. Well, this particular bank quoted me 3.5% or that particular bank quoted me th uh, 3%. In my humble opinion, rates are all the same. Mm -hmm. Product, as the pricing is what is the change and the type of product that you are qualifying for. Because conventional, rate might be different from FHA's rate. Mm -hmm. uh, a 3% portfolio product within the bank's rate might be different from the regular conventional payment. And then you're talking about down payment. How much money are you putting down? So the more money you put down, the greater or the more uh, uh, a positive you're going to get on that interest rate. Mm -hmm. But for our community, and when we're talking about the African American community and the community of color, we, we don't, we, in, in most cases, we don't get that option. We don't have that option to put 20% down mm -hmm. and get the A plus rate. We're limited to the FHA product. We're limited to the portfolio product, which is a 30 year fixed, no mortgage insurance. Mm -hmm. We're limited to maybe a home ready product or a home possible product, which are 3% down. But the key is the mortgage insurance. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of people need to be educated on, especially in our community, because mortgage insurance is really a, it's a big hit to, towards your bottom line payment. So example, if you're doing FHA, the mortgage insurance for FHA is a basic percentage. It's crossed the line, can't change it, 0.85, there it is. Mm -hmm. But for some of these other products, like a conventional product, well, the mortgage insurance could be much higher based on your credit score. Mm -hmm. So you can come to the tables with a 640 or a 650 credit score and go conventional, put 5% down, but now that mortgage insurance premium is going to be much higher. Yeah. Okay, same for the home ready product, which you can have a credit score as low as 620. Mm -hmm. But what's going to get you is that mortgage insurance. Mm -hmm. That mortgage insurance premium on a home ready product at 3% down could be somewhere in the ballpark of 1.8 or 1.81%. Double. Do the math. Yeah. You know, so based on that loan amount that you're trying to get, you might have a mortgage insurance payment of $250, $260. So that's why the education of product, programs, consultation, Credit scores higher, because the higher your credit scores are, 
lower the mortgage insurance, more opportunity, you're not pigeonholed, pigeonholed into one product. So, so what we're trying to do with the NARAB uh, event on Saturday the 13th of uh, April is to bring the community in mm -hmm. and let them ask questions. What are your challenges? <coughs> You're gonna have professionals there that are there for you to answer the questions. Never let anybody give you a fast no, because it's always a slow yes. And when that, with that slow yes, my philosophy is always about, again, I go to the process. If it takes you 60 days, mm -hmm. if it takes you 90 days, if it takes you 120 days, if it takes you a year, what is the objective? Get the house. Get the house. And get, so, it, and get it right. And get it right. Trent Bowman, Vice President, Community Development Officer for uh, Klein Bank, a division of Old National Bank, sponsor of today's program. Thank you so much for being here. And remind you to join Trent and join me. I'll be mm -hmm. moderating for the, uh, the Home Ownership Fair. Uh, at the John B. Davis Education Center on West yes. Broadway. It's from 10 to 2 on the 13th of April. Yes. Get the information you need. Get on the path to owning a home. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. First, we want to thank sponsors for today's program. Sponsors include Old National Bank and the Home Ownership Alliance. The topic today is home ownership, wealth creation. How do we build health and wealth in our community? I have two experts uh, at the table with me, two friends, colleagues, leaders and community leaders in their profession. David McGee is executive director of Wealth Build Minnesota. It's a 501c3. It's a uh, community development financial institution certified as such by the U.S. Department of Treasury. And since 2004, uh, Wealth Build Minnesota and David McGee have worked to help thousands of families become self-sufficient and to become uh, and build assets uh, that uh, are sustainable to create sustainable social and economic wealth in our community. Brian Crosby is the Brian Crosby is the financial inclusion manager of Prepare and Prosper, and uh, he's been with that organization since 2016. Uh, he brings to the work uh, strong relationships and a deep commitment to improving financial lives in low-income communities, and he brings an entrepreneurial mindset with the intent of building out uh, an ambitious financial access in reach initiative. FAIR, FAIR Initiative. In this role, he uh, leads a bold new approach designed to address the financial inclusion gap for the 194,432 households that are financially underserved in Twin Cities. You have to name it, right? And you've named it in saying this number of households are the ones that uh, we have to target to make a change. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. Let me ask you, first of all, uh, David, to talk about uh, the vision, how you started, why you started Wealth Build Minnesota. Yeah, that's Build Wealth Minnesota. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, Build Wealth Minnesota. And thanks for having me uh, today, Al. And, uh, um, me and my wife had initially started Build Wealth Minnesota after uh, been in banking for a number of years. And uh, it was kind of a spiritual move for me to begin to start giving back to community after traveling the country, auditing banks, and uh, doing everything in banking, with the exception of being a teller, uh, to give back some of this information uh, to our community. So we started a training and education component that's going to uh, the community and start training underserved folks to be underwriters. And those are the ones who decide whether or not you get a loan or not was the initial uh, focus. And then uh, we started to see the rates drop and we started seeing some predatory practices and then we decided we were going to go into, started out in churches doing financial education and trying to get people prepared not to be taken advantage of and positioned to not only gain wealth, but to get sustainable wealth. 
that they could pass down for generations. How, how did you do that in churches, for example? What did you do? How did you approach a church and what plan did you enact through a congregation? Well, we, at churches, we were talking to pastors. Um, I'm actually associated with churches. I'm an associate pastor. And so it was our objective to go in and meet with the pastor. And um, the pastors in the churches have the year every Sunday morning and sometimes throughout the week of um, a lot of folks. And we were primarily focusing on the African-American community. Um, where 80% of us are church for the most part. Mm -hmm. And so the goal was to see that we were, uh, we were finding that a lot of folks were being taken advantage of and that was a, a good pool of information and people that would probably be ready listeners if their pastor had given us the opportunity to come in. So we started doing workshops mm -hmm. um, at the churches initially. Some churches I understood, um, I understand, had uh, established congregation goals that everybody in the church would have a credit score uh, <laughs> north of 700. I don't know if you've dealt with those churches at all or not. How does that sound as a strategy though? That sounds like a great strategy, mm -hmm. a little, little high yeah. bar to reach, <laughs> but um, a lot of times we, we had a lot of challenges with that because people go to church for spiritual matters, mm -hmm. not financial matters. Right. But a lot of times our financial matters put such a damper on our spiritual health mm -hmm. and our, our overall health for, for the most part. So we are finding that and then we started developing this family stabilization plan as our primary program uh, where we took about 11 different programs and put them into one long intensive and comprehensive process where cohorts of families would go through 10 to 12 weeks worth of uh, intensive financial training like going to college. Mm -hmm. You and your family are going to financial college to get yourself um, acclimated to systems around finances and then we paired them up with coaches that would work with them for another 18 months and up to two years worth of time to really make transformative change in their lives always giving them opportunities to build wealth and learn systems to stop wealth from draining out of our households and really learning systems I mean there's a lot of systems that are good and bad and um, we parents because of lack of knowledge and so our goal was to get that knowledge and information into these families so these families can be um, a lot more stable and begin to start building economic wealth and assets. Brian, what's the vision at uh, FAIR, the Financial Access and Reach Initiative? Tell me about that. So, you know, like you mentioned, uh, with FAIR, we have 194,000 households. Um, so that's obviously more people than that, but households in the Twin Cities that um, are disconnected from a financial institution. Um, so what we want to do, what we wanted to do is create um, products and a process that would help to bring those people back into the financial mainstream because, you know, I think as David can speak, if you're talking about building wealth and home ownership, um, you know, you, you do need to be connected to a bank um, and to be able to get, begin to make some of those relationships to start moving um, up that ladder. So why are these households not connected with a financial institution? What are the stories, maybe there's some anecdotes you can tell me that sort of typify or share uh, experiences people have that keep them either out of uh, or unable to or unwilling to or unsure of how to right. be connected and to take advantage of the opportunities that these systems can provide? So I think there's a lot of um, folks that self-select out of the financial mainstream and I think a lot of the time is because accounts aren't built for them. Um, a lot of times we're dealing with people who have volatile incomes who you know may make a lot of money in the summer and not in the winter and they may feel like a bank account doesn't follow them through those ebbs and flows. Um, so we have a lot of people that we see that have gotten into uh, a cycle of overdrafts you know if their uh, account didn't follow them during a downtime in their income now they're in an overdraft cycle which will effectively kick them out of the banking system if they're not able to, to rectify that. Um, so I think there's a lot of people who have chosen to get out of that, the, that um, uh, industry, you know, because the accounts weren't working for them. Uh, I think a lot of people have been, you know, shut out and kicked out of the, the, the industry as well um, for the same reason. So I think, you know, it's really just about finding accounts that really work for people where they are. So what do you do? How do you help them? So I think, and, and so the help you're providing really is not just for the individuals. You're helping the institutions as well. It sounds to me, if you bring them together. I think we are. Um, you know, I, I think the help that we're we're providing um, folks is, you know, again we talked about if you want to move up that wealth building ladder, you know, 
you have to have a checking account. It's almost impossible to own a home if you're dealing with prepaid cards or you know check cashers and things like that. Um, so we really wanted to kind of start with those foundations of you need to be able to spend your money safely. So you need to have a transaction account. Uh, you need to have a safe way to save some money. Um, we know that our customers may not have a ton of money at the end of the month to save, but we want them to be able to put it into a savings account rather than you know a sock drawer or under your bed. Under your bed. Um, and then there's the credit building. You know you you have to have um, opportunities to to be able to build your credit. Um, you know the congregation that wants to get up to a 700 credit score. You know which, which is great. It is a high bar, but you have to be able to get those opportunities to start working on your credit. So you know what FAIR is is really a bundled um, set of accounts that does those three things. It's a transactional checking account, there's a savings account, and then there's a credit builder loan that helps people um, work on their credit. Do you actually provide a loan? So the credit builder loan, it's, it's kind of a hybrid, hybrid product. I usually explain it's like a layaway loan. Mm -hmm. So it's a loan that's backed by a CD and long story short is they they are approved for a loan, um, which the bank kind of turns into a certificate of deposit. So they don't get that money up front. But then what they do is they make uh, small monthly payments of $30 a month towards this $500 loan slash CD. Mm -hmm. And those monthly payments are then able to be reported to all of the credit bureaus as on-time loan payments. Mm -hmm. So they do that, that program, they're in it for 18 months. At the end of it, they get the $500 CD, so they've been building up their savings over that time, uh, and they've also been building up their credit history so um, and having those money, payments reported to the money. bureaus. Yeah. yeah, and so how do they turn that into opportunity? So, you know, what we hope is that at the end of, you know, call it an 18-month period after they've done this credit builder, that they're in a better position, you know, credit score-wise, credit history-wise, to go out and get some other forms of credit that will continue to build their, their history. Um, this is really a stepping stone. It's kind of the first, uh, a first step in, in that um, journey. And, you know, obviously there's lots of other types of, you know, programs that, you know, such as what Build Wealth does and, and throughout the Twin Cities, other programs that will help people kind of build onto that. So it's really a foundational, you know, um, uh, product to help people start that uh, process of building a, a credit report history. So uh, David, let me go back to you. You've spent uh, 33 years in the banking industry. You've got sort of the insider's experience. You kind of know how the systems work and you know where our people either fail or are failed by the institutions and the processes. Um, what are you discovering as the major barriers to financial uh, literacy financial sustainability for our people. When it comes to, uh, the, go ahead. how much of it is internal in our side, how much of it is structural from outside? It's got to be a combination, I think. Well, I think there's um, the, the structural side. I'll, I'll start there as uh, Brian was stating. Um, banks have become um, more transactional and banks have become much larger. And so there's, there's not a value proposition a lot of times for our folks where um, trust is a major challenge. We don't, we don't trust banks. We don't trust that system. Um, many of us have started it and there's a lack of education from the bank. So as banks get larger, there's less hands-on. There's less, there was a time where uh, years ago you worked with a bank and a bank was a pillar of community and you sat down and you, you got a banker and the banker be, began to educate you about products and process. Has that ever been truly the case for the black community? I don't know that it has. I, I think it, there, maybe when we were back years, 30 years, 40 years ago, maybe 50, and they would come to our schools and they'd give you a little blue passbook. Mm -hmm. They'd teach you about savings. And there was, there was a relationship at that time. But as banks got bigger and um, they're, 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 they're profit driven and was their motivation. And a lot of the black community doesn't, didn't have a lot of resources and assets to be appealing to a bank. And so the less assets and less opportunity for me to earn money, the less time I'd probably be willing or even able as a bank to put in mm -hmm. uh, because it, it's not economically viable for me to put a bunch of energy in right. something where I'm not going to make money. Mm -hmm. And so banks have gotten more and more, the bigger they become, the more transactional they become. So a lot of times you, you call and you press nine, mm -hmm. press 
three. You know, right. you know there's, a, there's not, not that person. human yeah. contact for mm -hmm. the most part. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm liking about the FAIR product is that they've made a relationship with the bank that they, they can be that, that, that conduit between the bank and then also utilizing distributors who already are on the ground, like a Build Wealth, that have a relationship and have become a trusted advisor. So there's touch all the way along the way. And then it gives us the opportunity to teach in detail through the financial literacy what this banking system means and how can that bank actually benefit the family and what can this bank and being in a relationship with this bank do over time as it relates to saving me money, um, helping me to earn money, mm -hmm. and helping me to move beyond just looking at a checking account or a savings account, an overdraft for the most part, mm -hmm. to looking at some other financial products that could be um, opportunities for my family to actually start gaining wealth and assets. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. I'm going to continue with my conversation with my guest, David McGee, Executive Director of Build Wealth Minnesota. I said it right this time. And with Brian Crosby, who's the Financial Inclusion Manager of Prepare and Prosper. And gentlemen, when I come back, I want to focus on uh, success stories. Uh, what stories can you tell me that show that uh, the work that you're engaged in is the right way, is pointing the way to financial solvency and uh, financial sustainability in our community. And I'm also interested in uh, giving people some phone numbers and, and websites that they can reach uh, out to connect with you and organizations that you support that support our community as well. I want to tell people that are listening and watching on social media, uh, like this program, if you like the kind of content we're creating, like this and share it, let people know that we're around. We think this is an important topic, important conversation. Stay tuned, we'll talk more in just a few minutes. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland, continuing a conversation with David McGee, Executive Director of Build Wealth Minnesota, and Brian Crosby, who's Financial Inclusion Manager of Prepare and Prosper. And our topic today is building wealth, building financial capability in our community. An important conversation, an important uh, thing to be talking about. I, I feel this conversation ought to be had around dinner tables in every house in our community. Before we go, I want to thank uh, sponsors, supporters for this program, Old National Bank and uh, the Home Ownership Alliance in Twin Cities. Thank them for their support and their work to help build opportunity in our community. Uh, David, Build Wealth Minnesota. So the value proposition you would say is what? For Build wealth. For build wealth is um, getting, I think our biggest is to get generational wealth mm -hmm. um, creation to our community. There's been a lot of generational poverty, especially in the um, communities of color. Mm -hmm. And some of the biggest priority propositions is getting them to build social as well as economic wealth and lower the cost of money through knowledge and wisdom and linking them to resources. So let's unpack generational wealth or generational poverty, what does it mean? Uh, what, what are, when you describe that, how does it look? Uh, what has been the impact of generational poverty? And then what strategies, uh, what knowledge will move us towards the solution side of that equation? I, I think, uh, and Brian was talking about it very briefly earlier about generational poverty is um, basically going through generations of lacking knowledge about systems and doing the same thing the same way and getting similar results where we're consistently broke, consistently without, and consistently not building up wealth because of different systems that have been in existence for decades, centuries, mm -hmm. for that matter. And if you don't have someone who has wealth or you don't have relationships or social wealth or relationships it's not always what we know, it's who we know. And so if I can't tap into the knowledge base or the resource or a 
a relationship that can help me get a hand up, then I'll never be able to tap into the opportunity to start gaining wealth. So we will continue to have generation after generation that will lack knowledge and not earn or save or build any type of wealth for their family. On the flip side of that is building generational wealth is starting to educate <coughs> excuse me, folks about systems and how to use systems effectively. Uh, a lot of systems were not made for communities of color for the most part. There's still um, debt ratios and different mortgage systems and products that have been around for decades that haven't changed. Um, during the times they were created, African Americans and people of color were never even using those products, but they've never changed the strategy and the functionality of those systems. For example? Um, like uh, we'll look at mortgage banking. For the most part, mortgage banking has, I'm, I'm an underwriter, I've trained underwriters, it's the same underwriting system mm -hmm. that's been in place for over 70 years. Mm -hmm. 70 years ago, very few African Americans or communities of color were even in the position to purchase a home. There was the 40 acres in the mew, and then there was the FHA and the redlining and all these different things. So if that system still exists, and you don't know the intricate details of how that system works, how can you and your family take advantage of that system? Um, just the, the system of credit is something that's critical now. It's, it, it's a system that goes, and if you don't know about it, and you haven't been taught about it, and your second generation credit user, you have no clue that by having great credit or better credit or the 700 credits that you talked, the scores that you talked about earlier, um, you didn't know that by having great credit, everything you're able to access is cheaper. You get better uh, landlords, you get better uh, rates of percentages on car loans, you get a better opportunity to actually purchase a home. So if you didn't know that system of credit, you literally are stuck in a generational spiral of poverty that stays there by educating people what that credit system means to that family mm -hmm. and getting them in a place to use that as a tool to strengthen the family by now we have great credit and we're, we thrive for great credit and I want my son to have great credit mm -hmm. and his son to have great credit even if it's a system that we don't agree with, it's a system that exists. It exists and yeah. so if we don't learn how to do that, so if there's a housing system it's another thing we teach is mm -hmm. how to purchase a house. We, we want to talk about homes. Mm -hmm. And so this is where um, I lay and my children lay and I, I protect. And this is where everything that I do is from this home. It's critical and the opportunity to use the value in a good market, the value of that house is going up on a regular basis, building equity for my family that ultimately I can use to send children to college, I can use to start a business, mm -hmm. and if that's not something that's inbred into multiple generations, we can mm -hmm. have generations without having anything. We just came through the worst recession of all time, and so values of homes had went way down, mm -hmm. but now the market is moving up at a rapid pace right now. Black wealth was decimated. Literally, literally. Yeah. In, in Minnesota is, and nationwide. This is about the third time we went, we can get into that another show, but mm -hmm. this is about the third time we've gone through some iteration of wealth stripping and wealth um, d just decrease in our, our communities. But now we're at a place where there are opportunities um, and that this window is kind of closing because the opportunity of values to go up on a regular basis, now the cost is getting to a place where some folks can't afford that but being able to get it at a certain place where um, we had um, sold houses a couple of years ago at $190,000. Those same houses are at um, 250, 260. So some, we're getting to a place now, even with the Home Ownership Alliance, we're figuring out there's a, there's a lack of inventory mm -hmm. for folks at, at lower incomes, which African-Americans and communities of color are usually at a lower income base won't even, they're, they're gonna be priced completely out of the market. So had they had gotten the education early on, they would have rolled the wave, so to speak, and they'd be the ones owning the $60,000 with the equity. The to to build more, more equity, equity. that's right. Exactly. I'm Al McFarland, this is Conversations with Al McFarland, my guest, David McGee, Executive Director of Build Wealth Minnesota, and Brian Crosby, who's Financial Inclusion Manager of prepare and prosper. We're talking about 
wealth building, uh, about building assets in our community, building capability, uh, knowledge, uh, strengthening the community. Brian, let me ask you, first of all, to give us the, uh, the elevator story on Prepare and Prosper. Great name. What's the vision, the mission of the organization? Yeah, thank you. So Prepare and Prosper um, is most widely known um, for doing free tax preparation for low-income individuals. So we do that for over 12,000 folks a year. And at that time, we actually help um, get them into, you know, savings accounts and uh, other financial products um, at that tax money moment. Uh, we also um, manage a financial coaching program, um, and then we work, work, work with FAIR. So everything that we're, we're doing is really about empowering folks to, um, you know, kind of take these, you know, times in their life, especially at taxes when you're getting money, and, and use that to kind of, you know, start a nest egg or start, you know, a savings or start, you know, um, building for um, that, that future that you want. So that's really what Prepare and Prosper um, does, and we've been um, around since 1971, so they've been doing that for a long time. What's your personal story? How did you come to this work? What's your training and background? And how did you find yourself uh, on this uh, mission, uh, being an advocate and a champion for uh, financial freedom for our people? I would say I'm a reformed corporate person, mm -hmm. um, so I uh, have, you know, worked in, you know, sales and for some pretty large corporations, and I really um, I moved back to Minnesota. I grew up here and moved back uh, almost six years ago now, and I really wanted to help, you know, build my community. You know, I, I grew up here, uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis gave me a lot, and I wanted to, um, I wanted to give back. I have two young sons now, and I wanted to be able to talk to them about what I do and have a lot of pride about it and then also show them, you know, how, the, how we can, you know, do this um, because we're also trying to build, you know, I'm trying to build gener generational wealth, wealth for them and, you know, to see me doing this work um, I think is important for, for my son. So uh, I really just wanted to give back to the community that, that raised me. And so what does financial freedom for our people mean to you? When I say that, when I read it from your, your bio here, your passion is building financial freedom for people in our community. What does that mean? How does it look? So I'll give you a great example. We're, um, you know, I've been in front of the legislature um, recently, and uh, one of our fair customers um, who agreed to testify, and her testimony, you know, essentially was, you know, she's in a credit builder product. Um, she's already seen improvements where she's been able to refinance car loans, mm -hmm. and she's working on being able to refinance her mortgage. Um, and she has an eight-year-old son who she's kind of, you know, she's a single mother and she's going through that with him. So she's able to have, you know, these conversations with her son about what she's doing to be able to really bring more money into the household. Because if you're refinancing your car loan, because like, you know, David mentioned, if you have a better credit score, you're going to pay less money. Um, if you go and refinance a mortgage, you're going to have more money in, in, in your monthly uh, budget, which is going to, you know, trickle down to what the eight-year-old son is doing and what he's seeing in the household as well. Um, so I think we're really building cases like this where, you know, people are um, using these products, taking them to really, you know, make a change in their life that's going to bring about, um, you know, real positive things that they can build on because, again, we're talking about building wealth for the future. So, you know, she's doing things right now that are helping her bring more money into her household. Mm -hmm and her son is watching her do this, so that's the gener generational wealth um, that we're really trying to build. So that's financial freedom to me, is being able to, you know, take, take you know, initiative, make the changes that you want to make, um, and build to a better future. I used the word uh, narrative early on in this segment of the show, and I stated, and I state that I think our mission in part is to create a new narrative, a new understanding, to reflect uh, the uh, capability and to focus on both existing but also the capacity to build assets in our community to shift the focus away from uh, the constant decrying uh, and uh, focus on the lack the lack is there it's not deniable you can't deny it it actually has to motivate us to move away from lack to a position of, uh, of holding uh, equity uh, holding power and so how do we change the narrative? My job as a communicator is to, to write about it, but I'm asking you gentlemen to think about uh, what it means, how important it is to shift the community's understanding about money, about power, about wealth. What do you think, uh, Brother? 
I think um, <clears throat> as we're doing th with our training and as uh, the coaching is going, it's just starting to show people, like I said, about systems. And systems aren't, um, it's, it's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. A lot of the stuff, is uh, you get an epiphany that, oh, I, didn't, I knew that. Um, it's just being exposed to, like I said, the intricate details of these systems and, and, and showing and uh, exposing how they work and why we're not a part of these systems is because we don't know the information. Some of the information has been hidden from us, but then um, a lot of the information is just blatantly in front of us, but we've never took the time to learn it. And uh, what we're finding here lately, and I've been finding over the last 15 years, is that a lot of times people don't dig into the information because they don't see themselves in the information. Um, and that, that's something if you've never generationally seen yourself. I, I had to, that same challenge. I'm a, a banker, a mathematician, and all these things. But when it came to investment, it was something that I had been so conditioned not to be a part of that I never got good grades in that area. And so now I, I've made it a point to bring that information and those systems and that knowledge to individuals about, um, you know, about what the stock market means and what stocks are and commodities are and, and how big a role we play in that system. Um, especially with African Americans, we are the biggest consumers on the planet. We set trends for spending money hmm. in good ways and bad ways for we the most part. We have sense. power. Mm -hmm. uh, there's economic power mm -hmm. in that spending. But if you don't understand that system and you're spending all this money, you're driving the economy. We drive a poverty economy as well as we drive a regular, the normal traditional economy because of the way we spend money. And there are corporations that are making money and know that. Mm -hmm. And not knowing how that system works, you never see there's, not, there's an opportunity to make a return for your family by knowing that, wait a minute, so we're spending um, trillions of dollars driving a system, but no one's giving us a royalty check. You know? But others are getting royalties and returns by investing in those companies that sell us those products. So why can't me and my family learn that system and invest in some of those same companies and reap the benefits and returns. We, we, we get the misery, they get the money, is one way I've That's described it. Yeah. <laughs> but it, I, I, I go there and I, 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 I don't want to be preaching, but we, we perish because of the lack of knowledge. Right. And that's one of the things, and so if you understand how the system works and you're willing to um, take the time, it's really not rocket science to actually engage in it, 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 it helps us. Um, I think what FAIR is doing with this, this new product, um, I mean, uh, Prepare and Prosper is doing with this FAIR product, is giving folks a chance on the ground level to be a part of an opportunity to change that narrative in the sense that you can start here and you can start saving. Hey, Gentlemen, we're out of time. Through. I want okay. to take a minute or two to have you uh, tell our listeners and our viewers how to connect with you, your organizations, and your mission. So. Uh, let's start with Prepare and Prosper. How do they connect with you? Um, so, pr connect with Prepare and Prosper. Um, obviously, we have preparingprosper.org is our website. Um, there is a specific website for the FAIR product, so the Checking, Savings, and Credit Builder, which is fairfinancial.org. Um, you can always call. My, my number is 651-262-2173. Um, and if you have questions about, you know, what we're doing and, and how we're getting out to the community, uh, I'd be more than willing to help. And uh, David McGee? Yeah, we're at um, buildwealthmn.org. Buildwealthmn.org is our website. Um, our phone number is 612-877-4182. And if you're interested in uh, taking any of the training under the Family Stabilization Plan, you can enroll right online. Well, thank you both gentlemen. Thank you and good luck and continued success in your work. Thank you on behalf of uh, our community. It's important work uh, and we wish you continued success. To those listening and to those uh, listening, uh, if you like this kind of conversation, share it, like us on Facebook, and uh, stay connected. We appreciate your interest and your involvement as well. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. Support for Conversations with Al McFarland was provided by Old National Bank Comcast
Home Ownership Opportunity Alliance, and North American Banking Company.